Have you played Hades yet? It's finally out of early access and it's a total winner. I think it's my game of the year. The characters, the feel of the combat, the boon system, the different weapons, the avalanche of great dialogue, it's all wonderful. But Hades didn't spring fully formed from the head of Greg Kasavin. Supergiant is no stranger to fantastic action games, but Hades is the endpoint in a long line. Pyre, Transistor, and Bastion. Hades is an amalgamation of everything the people at Supergiant Games have accomplished, laser focused and polished to a mere shine. The 11 year path they took to get to Hades was full of fascinating design choices, false starts, fixes, feedback, tweaks, and iterations. Let's talk about the road to Hades, how to refine a game, and how Supergiant turns something good into something great. You know what else is something good? You. You know what's something great? You. With today's episode sponsor, Skillshare. I'm taking a class from Jake Bartlett called Animating with Ease in After Effects. It's a real nuts and bolts guide to the graph editor, one of the most important tools you can use to make animations feel livelier. I'm using After Effects as we speak to make this video, and Jake made a great, well-written guide to mastering one of the most powerful tools it has. Skillshare is an amazing resource for high-quality educational classes on all kinds of topics. Animation, UI and UX design, creative writing, marketing, music, any creative endeavor you're into, Skillshare can help you get way better at it, in a much faster way than trying to piece together mediocre YouTube tutorials. It's all at your fingertips if you sign up for their free trial. The first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium, so you can explore your creativity. Skillshare. I wouldn't keep talking about it if it wasn't good. Go try it out. Supergiant is not a big studio. From the start, they've made their games with a small team. Bastion was the work of just seven core members, plus a small number of support people, and even Hades was made with under 20. One benefit of having such a small team is that Supergiant has a very distinct brand. Supergiant games feel cut from the same cloth, and that sense of authorship comes through with each new game. Advance one step further, one step at a time. Hades might be the ultimate expression of that expertise. But to get a sense of just what they've done, we can't start at the end. We have to start at the beginning. With Bastion. Proper story is supposed to start at the beginning. Ain't so simple with this one. Supergiant began life in 2009 with three main members. Amir Rao, Gavin Simon, and Greg Kasavin. All former EA employees who worked together on the Command & Conquer series. They were inspired by the wave of smaller scale indie titles like Braid and Plants vs. Zombies and decided to break off and take their own shot at making something along those lines. Bastion's gameplay focuses on real-time third-person action in discrete encounters that pop up as you travel through the world, plus some light RPG management mechanics. The game's path is fixed, with the world literally building the route in front of you as you go from fight to fight, plus some other action sequences sprinkled in with a central hub tying the stages together. You choose your weapons and special move loadout, and off you go. There's a healthy amount of choice and customization in the combat, and the actions feel very satisfying to play. Bastion's combat was top class, but its original show-stopping feature was just how it told its story. Bastion drew inspiration from the works of novelist Cormac McCarthy, known for his post-apocalyptic and western stories. The idea was to combine McCarthy with a fantasy world like you'd see in a JRPG, and that general tone and aesthetic developed into the final game. The story is centered around the theme of rebuilding a world shattered in a cataclysmic event, and as your character walks through the landscape, it rebuilds itself piece by piece. The theme of rebuilding was originally more prominent, but as the game continued development and more people like Gen Z and Logan Cunningham joined the team, the vision started to focus more on the presentation and atmospheric storytelling. Gen's artwork was striking, but Logan's voiceover work was a game changer. And just like that, the Bastion comes alive. Starts growing again, growing stronger. Kids gotta put its power to good use. As you fight through the ruined lands of Ceylandia, there's an ever-present narrator painting a delightful picture of the world and its story. 
voiced by Cunningham, the narrator comments on everything as it happens, including the player's actions in combat. And then he falls to his death. I'm just fooling. With a distinct style, he weaves together the story of Ceylandia and the Calamity and your place in it all. By seamlessly mixing the lore with the player's own actions, they interweave the game's narrative and gameplay without disrupting either one. Both reinforce each other and are equal parts of the whole. The distinct narration brings to life the game's world without creating it all visually, a real boon for a team with limited development resources. Through the heavily stylized but fresh and exciting narration, Bastion's narrator added a ton of life, atmosphere, and charm to the story, and let the game punch way above its weight. Bastion was every bit the indie darling they were hoping to build from the start, but now they were a successful indie studio. With success comes expectations. According to Rao and Kasavin, there was a lot of pressure to make the follow-up to Bastion just as good and they didn't want to disappoint their newfound fans with their next game. While planning out their follow-up, the team initially wanted to throw out most of the same design solutions that they had used for Bastion. They wanted to start over, find new solutions to their problems, and let the next game carve its own path. That next game would become Transistor. Transistor's pre-production phase took a fairly long time to finish because of that initial decision. It turns out that starting over on the same problem sometimes leads you back to the same solution. The camera angle, for instance, took a long time to settle. After trying a lot of different approaches, they landed back on practically the same isometric orientation that had been in Bastion. The basis of Transistor's story took a long time to figure out as well. They started with a young badass boxer as the lead character pairing with a spiritual companion as he went along his quest. But the team never really fell in love with the concept. In one meeting, Kazavin asked Gen Z, do you want to try something else? And within an hour, she landed on an idea for what became Transistor's final protagonist, the voiceless singer, Red. The boxer switched roles, with his voice becoming the voice inside the Transistor. That initial quick concept was pretty close to the final design. Transistor wound up with a structure not unlike Bastion's. It's another game of wandering around an environment, getting into combat encounters, with an unfolding narrative told through environmental storytelling, data logs, chat rooms, and more Logan Cunningham voiceovers. What a night. You're still in one piece. That's all that matters. The setting shifts to a cyberpunk noir story and is a lot more abstract than the first game. There is no narrator directly talking to you as an omnipresent force. Instead, your sword is your partner, reacting to what's ahead of you rather than telling a tale. The story itself is more open to interpretation than Bastion, and asks the player to connect the dots more so than Bastion did. The environments, music, atmosphere, and tone are what the story leans on, rather than just the narration element in Bastion, though the narration is still an important part of the game. The game's setting and narrative are solid, but Transistor's biggest changes appear in its combat mechanics. The combat is still similar to Bastion on the surface, but it goes so much deeper. In keeping with the cyberpunk setting, the combat is themed around computer programming. Yes, it works. Hang with me here. Instead of the weapon loadout from Bastion, Transistor lets you customize your abilities, called functions. You can equip up to four unique functions at a time out of a total of 16. Also, combat in Transistor can be paused. To get the most out of the functions you bring with you, you will have to plan out a sequence of actions to take, which will then be performed automatically. Kind of similar to an ATB system in some Final Fantasy games, but Transistor's killer feature was in how the functions interacted with each other. You can attach your unused functions to your equipped ones to create a huge array of customized effects and properties for your base moveset. For example, there's a function called Jaunt. By itself, it lets you dash across the field, there's another called Friend, which summons a robot dog companion to fight with you. If you attach Friend to Jaunt, every time you dash, you leave behind a decoy that draws enemy aggro. Every one of the functions can combo in unique ways like this. You can also put them into some additional passive slots for exponentially more customization options. This system opened up a ton of creativity and experimentation into the combat system, to a degree few games have ever truly had. You could really put your own signature into your character's loadout and make the game suit your preferences top to bottom. Transistor was released to solid reviews and decent financial success, which gave Supergiant a little more freedom to get weird with their third game, Pyre.
It's easily the most unique game in Supergiant's library, with drastically different gameplay and story structure. The game isn't a string of action-based combat encounters. You're playing as a merry band of travelers, going from place to place to compete in mystic sports matches slash rituals for the right for your characters to rejoin the society they've been exiled from. Pyre is set in a high fantasy world with a larger cast of characters than the last two games. The world is more varied, with a large variety of biomes, fantasy races, and opposing factions all vying for the same prize you're fighting for. Instead of the weapon loadouts in Bastion, or the functions from Transistor, Pyre's gameplay choice mainly derives from party compositions. Each character has their own unique moveset, and the combinations that make up your team naturally change how you approach each match. During the rights, your goal is to dunk an orb into your opponent's fire until its HP drains to zero. To mix things up, the game uses an aura system for attacking and disabling your competition. If a character touches an opponent's aura, they'll be knocked out temporarily, making it easier to score. You can literally throw your aura as an attack and every character has their own take on these special moves. While you hold on to the orb, your aura is unavailable, making you extremely vulnerable, so careful movement and passing becomes important. Just like real fake basketball, dunking the orb does more damage, but the player who dunked it will have to sit out an entire round. Between the different ways to score, attack, and defend, the system is surprisingly deep, with tons of risk and reward elements to consider throughout. Pyre's quirky, unique combat is fun, but its biggest step forward for the studio came in how it played with story structure. It's not a straightforward start-to-finish narrative like Bastion and Transistor. The narration takes a bit of a backseat, but Logan Cunningham is still around as the Arch Justice, a pompous and antagonistic voice who oversees the rituals. Reader, dare you tamper with forbidden knowledge? So soon after your sentence into exile. Most of the story is delivered in visual novel segments as you go from match to match. The story is driven more directly by the player's success and failure, which lets the story branch more deeply rather than just a few lines of dialogue responding to weapon choices or the like. The narrative focus is on your individual team members' character arcs and how they progress through the ritual system. There's no fail state in Pyre either. No matter how many matches you lose, even in the big deal Liberation Rites, the story just keeps going. It has something written about every scenario, including if you fail to win any of the rights and your characters all remain as they were in exile. Characters change their personal arcs depending on the choices you make while preparing for each of the rights. The gameplay segments and the narrative make a feedback loop. Success in the gameplay segments changes the story, Investment in the story changes the choices you'll want to make for the gameplay segments. It interweaves the two to a much greater extent than they first achieved in Bastion, and makes the story's progress feel much more personal. Pyre received critical acclaim and sold well enough for a more niche title, but their attention turned to their next project. It was time to put it all together. The team wanted to make a game that was playable in short bursts, and release it to the public as early as possible so their development process could be seen by their fanbase and they could respond to feedback. A return to the openness they had first tried in a series of videos done in a collaboration with Giant Bomb while creating Bastion. They settled on making a roguelike, and teamed up with the Epic Game Store to release the game in early access in December of 2018. The game heavily draws from Greek mythology, with all of the game's major characters and backstories derived from stories the team and the audience were familiar with. You play as Zagreus, the prince of the underworld, trying to fight his way to the surface to escape his father, Hades. The Olympic gods help you on your way, giving blessings in the form of direct upgrades to your weapons and other stats. You run from room to room in the underworld, fighting monsters as you go like other action-oriented dungeon crawlers, and getting a reward at the end of them. Coins for care on shop, more boons from the Olympic gods, pomegranates to improve your boons, darkness and gems to permanently upgrade Zagreus and the House of Hades, and many, many more. It's very much a roguelike at heart. You're not likely to beat it on your first or even your first couple dozen runs, but slowly, your permanent upgrades and your personal skill at combat will improve and get you ever closer to your end goal. Along the way, you'll hear tons of dialogue between you, the residents of the House of Hades, and the Olympic Gods. Every run will have characters commenting on the last runs you've done, or gods commenting on the interactions you've had with other gods already in this run. Each of the characters is teeming with personality, and it all shines through wonderfully in the script. Hades fuses everything Supergiant has learned, 
using what they've learned from the strongest elements of each of their previous games. The core combat and narration of Bastion, the customization of Transistor, and the interweaving story and gameplay structure of Pyre. Hades fuses them all and takes each element even further, combining them with an overarching roguelike framing to make by far my favorite of their games. Hades returns the Bastion style of action RPG combat. You have a variety of weapons to choose from for each run, and each has unique basic and special attacks to make every weapon a significant departure from the others. But Supergiant has come a long way since Bastion. Bastion's combat never felt bad, but in comparison, Hades' combat is much faster, smoother, and feels more responsive. The combat animations are super fluid, and the effects and hit sparks are flashier, which make the moment-to-moment -moment combat feel more visceral and satisfying. The structure of the game has been overhauled from Bastion and feels more lively and impactful. The room-to-room -room dungeon crawler format with discrete rewards make each combat encounter feel more purposeful than Bastion's more arbitrary encounters between story beats. Hades' gameplay structure offers a clear set of micro goals and immediate rewards to keep you motivated at every step while climbing the path up out of the underworld. Hades builds on Transistor's penchant for choice and customization thanks to its reward previews. Each door to a new chamber shows you the category of reward you're going to get at the end of the next encounter. Some of the specific reward types are randomized, but you'll at least know which god's boons you'll get, or that you'll receive money, darkness, a Daedalus hammer, max health boosts, or others. Like the functions in Transistor, this system lets you build your character in the way you want, with a wide variety of build styles and combinations between the different boons and upgrades. The loadout system is a little more gamified than in Transistor 2. Instead of totally freeform loadouts, you'll have to adapt to the boon's random nature, bit by bit. You might get a powerful boon of a specific style early, then you might choose to build your character entirely around a super-powered special attack, or built around dealing damage over time, or dozens of other unique builds. The randomized nature makes the concept of a best build not really something you can plan around, which prevents the system from feeling stagnant over time. Sometimes you'll get upgrades that synergize extremely well, and sometimes your build will turn into an unfocused mess that you have to fight tooth and nail to make work. Each run becomes genuinely unique, which also makes each run much more dramatic. The cherry on top of it all is Hades' story structure. It's tied just as deeply into the game's roguelike run-based structure as the combat. Zagreus' relation to each of the members of the House of Hades and the Olympians is doled out a little at a time on each run. Plotlines are weaved throughout, advancing little by little as you go out, get defeated, and come back. If not the next step in a plot, you'll get bits of lore on enemies and places you found, or quips on how or to whom you got killed by the last run. The script has so much unique dialogue to see too, beyond just the plot relevant stuff. There are running jokes Zagreus will have with the bosses. Gameplay rewards like the Nectars tie into advancing the relationship between characters little by little, Nectars even reward you with accessories that, in turn, affect the strategy of your next runs. Every time through the underworld, a little more of the story falls into place, and even the gameplay elements you see are a meaningful expression of the world being woven in front of you. Just like how the run-based gameplay structure and randomized elements keep the combat feeling fresh, the way that Hades has written its story to react to and be a part of the nature of the roguelike is masterful, and keeps the narrative just as fresh. The step-by-step -step progress that Supergiant has made in their games is a testament to their skill as developers, and is a great thing to study. Head down to the comments and tell us about your favorite studio, and how they've progressed and improved their games over the years. Supergiant games have never been a stranger to smooth combat, but Hades is smoother. They've always brought compelling narration and story structure to their games, but here it's even more impressive. Hades is a blend of all the things Supergiant was already good at, made into a complete package, and is a game that will stick with me for a long time.